Is it really haunted? Was the Winchester Mystery House built to confuse the dark entities that tormented Sarah Winchester? We're going to explore a bit of history that is not well known to the public, a truth that defies the lore that was even adapted into the 2018 film Winchester. The legend that is often told says that Sarah, the wife of William Winchester, the founder of the Winchester Repeating Arms Company, had experienced a lot of tragedy in her life with the death of several family members. Then in 1881, after the death of her husband, Sarah had met with a psychic medium who told her that she was haunted by the spirits of those killed by her husband's guns. She was instructed to build a grand house that could confuse the spirits so they would not find her. Upon the death of her husband, Sarah had inherited a vast fortune and shares in her husband's company. With that money, she moved out west to San Jose and bought a farmhouse. From there, her staff of full-time carpenters kept busy constructing room after room, corridor after corridor, and making the house labyrinthine with doors that led to nowhere, stairs that ended at ceilings, and windows that didn't face outside. As work continued on the house, Sarah would supposedly retreat into a seance room to contact the spirits and plead with them to leave her be. Work on the house didn't cease until her death in 1922. Her personal belongings were inherited by her niece, and the house itself went up for auction, eventually becoming the popular tourist attraction it is today. That is the legend, but how true is it? Thanks to the internet, historians have been able to paint a much more vivid picture of the story of Sarah Winchester and her famous house. And the truth can be more interesting than fiction. Sarah Lockwood Pardee was born in 1839 in New Haven, Connecticut. Her father was a carpenter and so instilled in her an interest for architecture and design. William Wirt Winchester met Sarah during their childhood as their families were neighbors and the two families had grown close. The couple married in 1862, and soon after, William's sister died in childbirth, and the infant son would die soon after, along with her other two-year-old son. Sarah was no stranger to the death of a sibling. In childhood, one of her sisters had died young. Death would now be a constant theme in the lives of Sarah and William from this point on. In 1866, Sarah gave birth to her first child, a girl she would name Annie, after William's late sister. Unfortunately, the infant suffered from a condition called marasmus and struggled to feed. The baby died of starvation a month later. The Winchesters retreated into seclusion as a result of their grief, focused on their passion for architecture with the construction of a home on Prospect Hill. In 1869, Sarah's father died. But a decade later, there was a 10-month period of grief that would forever alter her future. In May of 1880, Sarah's mother died, and in December, her father-in-law died as well. And most tragically, the next year, in March of 1881, her husband William died of tuberculosis. Sarah had inherited from him a $20 million fortune and half ownership in her husband's rifle business, and she was left to support herself. Sarah had truly loved her husband, and his death left a great hole in her heart. She would spend her free time down by the seashore, looking away at the vast ocean. In 1884, her rheumatoid arthritis became so advanced that in order to manage her aches and pains, her physician recommended moving to a warmer, drier climate, suggesting California. It was that same year that her elder sister, Mary Converse, died. Sarah needed a change of scenery, both for her physical and mental health. She remembered that she had visited San Francisco with her husband in the past and decided to look for a place in the Santa Clarita Valley. She fell in love with a large farmhouse sitting on 45 acres of land on a road called Santa Clara Los Gatos Road and purchased the property in 1886. She hired a foreman and employed several local craftsmen of various nationalities to become her full-time builders. Originally, she hired architects to redesign her home, but was unsatisfied, so she took up the mantle alone. Sarah had leaned on her passion for architecture to pass her time and deal with her grief. She didn't socialize much, as her disability and morphing disfigurement left her somewhat of a recluse. 
However, she did develop close professional friendships with her servants and carpenters. She treated them well, paid them well, and of course, they all shared similar interests. Sarah called her new home Yanada Villa, since the surrounding landscape reminded her of Yanada Alavesa in Spain, a place she had previously visited with her late husband. The widow Winchester wasn't alone, however. She had convinced her two sisters Isabel and Estelle and their children to move to San Jose. Sarah would end up supporting her family for the rest of her life, as she had no children of her own, and her remaining family had meant so much to her. Her sister Estelle would suffer from a failed marriage and die from substance abuse. The other sister, Isabel, would move out of the Winchester house and into her own home, and Sarah helped with the renovations. The only family member who ended up living in the Winchester house with Sarah was her niece, Daisy. With nothing but an excess of space, money, and time, Sarah now had the freedom to explore her love of architecture to her heart's desire. She began adding more rooms to her home, creating a third floor, then a fourth and a fifth. She visited many architectural and garden exhibitions, learning new techniques and styles that she could experiment with. While the house was designed in a style called Queen Anne Revival, it was anything but typical for its era. Since Yanada Villa was part of her hobby and was never intended to be completed, Sarah would not work off of a master plan. Instead, she made additions room by room, section by section. And it didn't matter whether a room was midway through construction or if it had been seen through to completion. If she felt she could design it better, then she would have her carpenters rip it out and start anew. But it wasn't all hard work. Sarah would also dismiss the workers for long periods of rest, sometimes lasting several months of inactivity on the house. And when they would come back to resume their work, they were often eager to finish a previous project and start up a new one. This is all part of the reason why the house seems so rambling with corridors that meander and architectural features that don't make sense. If there is a glass skylight dividing the levels of an atrium, that is because there used to be a roof below. If the corridor is divided by steps that lead up and then back down, that is because you have entered a wing of the house that sits at a different level. Or if there is a window that is blocked by a wall, that is because a new section of the house was built where once there was an open view. One of the other features of the house that seems bizarre is the rather gradually sloping and winding stairway. As Sarah aged, her arthritis worsened and it became difficult for her to climb stairs. So she had her carpenters build her shallow steps, which required a much more lengthy incline just to get to the next level of the house. Into the 1890s, the house grew very large, so big it was difficult to miss. Locals were very curious about the widow. Gossip turned to local lore and whispers grew to outright lies. It didn't help that Sarah was such a recluse that she never felt the need to defend herself. You can imagine the amount of gossip that must have spread when locals saw the seven-story central tower, which was rebuilt 16 times before Sarah was satisfied with its design. A San Jose Daily News story from March 29, 1895, reported that the reclusive woman who owned Yanada Villa believes that when it is entirely completed, she will die. This superstition has resulted in the construction of a maze of domes, turrets, cupolas, and towers, covering territory enough for a castle. A family friend of the Winchesters refuted that story two years later in the same newspaper, but by then the stories and lore had already stuck, and Sarah was branded a woman driven mad by her grief. She didn't bother to make public statements or pen a defense for herself. Sarah had lived through so much emotional hardship that her only concern was the well-being of her family, friends, and workers, as well as her love for architecture. But by the turn of the 20th century, she was an aging woman who simply didn't care about the musings of high society. Supposedly, twice she had ignored a visit by a United States president, and the gates to her home remained locked which then sparked rumors that the woman was too snobby even for a visit from the president. But as newspapers printed their chastising remarks, Sarah continued to live the best life she could make for herself. After two decades of construction, the Yanada Villa, though large and meandering, had looked like an architectural masterpiece. And though many changes had been made along the way, 
It was an ongoing project that the widow had been very proud of. And then, tragedy struck again. On April 18, 1906, 20 years after her house first began to grow, the ground beneath the house started to tremble. The Great San Francisco Earthquake measured an estimated 7.9 on the Richter scale and had leveled much of the region and started fires that burned down what was left. The Yanata Via was heavily damaged, sections of the house crumbled into a pile of rubble, and the massive seven-story tower at the center had collapsed and brought down part of the house with it. Areas of the fourth and fifth floors had been leveled, and in many of the rooms, the plaster walls cracked and broke off in sheets, leaving nothing but the wooden studs, beams, and lath strips. Most of the chimneys had toppled as well, prompting workers to simply seal most of them up, rendering many of the fireplaces unusable. Thankfully, Sarah and her family had been unharmed during the shaking. It's not believed that the widow was even home when the shaking happened, but when she arrived to assess the damage, her heart, much like her home, had broken into many pieces. To say she was devastated would have been a vast understatement. She had considered just clearing the whole property and starting over, but in 1906, she was a 67-year-old woman, too tired and too weary to start anew. Instead, she instructed her workers not to rebuild what was once there, but instead to repair the damages and seal up the openings in the structure. This explains more of the reasons behind the confusing architecture of the house. Staircases that led to nowhere once led to other areas of the house. Doors that open up to the outside once led to balconies or rooms. Whole sections of buildings where simple wood clapboards juxtaposed the architectural design were simply walls that plugged openings where the building had collapsed. Sarah Winchester did not continue to build onto the property after the earthquake. She had given up probably out of fear that another tremor would just wipe out more of her hard work. The only thing she added to the house was an elevator in 1916. When climbing the custom-designed staircases of the house had become too difficult for her. Rumors about her continued to swirl, and it was like salt to the wound that was her life. She then ordered her workers to put up large hedges around the property to block views of her home, aiding her self-prescribed isolation. Though that might seem like a sad ending to the story of an elderly widow, it wasn't all sad. The public isn't aware that both before and after the earthquake, she had many real estate investments throughout the Bay Area. She had at least seven other properties besides the Yanata Villa, which included a new home in Los Altos, no more than seven miles away. She also had three houses in Atherton, one of which she had purchased in 1907 to be her permanent residence. It was a more modern craftsman-style home. While she lived in Atherton, she purchased land in the nearby city of Burlingame and owned all the land east of California Drive, from Broadway to Oak Grove. She dreamed of turning the property into a series of coastal estates for people visiting California. She even had her workers construct a canal and a small harbor to increase the waterfront property. She also owned a massive houseboat and had it towed into the artificial harbor for her to stay in on occasion. Though you can't see that the house on your screen is floating, note the swing-type davits for accommodating a lifeboat. Several years after she died, the houseboat would burn down. She also never lived to see her coastal estate dream completed, and the land is now a part of the city suburbs. Sarah Winchester was also later found to be an anonymous philanthropist she donated money to many causes, even donating money towards the people who were rendered homeless after the great San Francisco earthquake. But she insisted that she never be credited for her donations. And to this day, we don't know the full extent of how she helped her community. As I researched Sarah Winchester for this video, I found a massive labyrinth of information about her that was nearly as interesting and pleasantly convoluted as her famous mansion in San Jose. For example, she was an advocate for the suffrage movement and animal rights. There's also a good chance she was a devout vegetarian. She was a complex lady, far more interesting and more lovely than the stories of her being the grieving widow in black. In the summer of 1922, she had to leave her residence in Atherton and move back into Yanata Villa to be closer to her doctor. The end was near for the mysterious lady. 
and she died on September 5, 1922, at the age of 83. In her will, she divided up her remaining fortune and properties amongst her family and closest foremen and workers. Her Atherton home and all the belongings in each of her multiple houses were left to her loyal niece, Daisy. There was a stipulation in the will that if anyone disputed her wishes, they would get nothing. Eventually, some of the properties were sold off and redeveloped. The original San Jose home, the Yanata Villa, was considered worthless. There was still extensive damage to the home, and there were no valuable belongings left inside. And with the confusing layout of the rooms and infrastructure of the building, it would have cost a fortune to make the home livable. In fact, the land underneath the house held more value than the building itself. Nine months after her death, a man by the name of John Brown had rented the property in 1922, and he and his wife began offering tours of the home. They repeated the lore and legends about Sarah on the tours to give context to the house that visitors traversed. Eventually, John Brown purchased the entire property in 1931, and to this day, his descendants run the mansion as a successful tourist attraction. The home is very well kept, often in a preserved state as it was when Sarah died. Antique furniture was purchased to fill the various rooms in the empty house. The 45 acres of land surrounding the property was gradually sold off and redeveloped until now all that's left is the five acres in which the 24,000 square foot house currently sits, surrounded by dreary gray and uninspired modern buildings that tower over it. The house you see today is vastly different than the eight bedroom farmhouse Sarah bought in 1886. By the time Sarah died, the home had 160 rooms, 2,000 doors, 10,000 windows, 47 fireplaces, 17 chimneys, 40 stairways, 40 bedrooms, 2 ballrooms, 13 bathrooms, 6 kitchens, 3 elevators, 2 basements, and much of the building was both constructed and decorated with redwood, which explains the strength and longevity of this old structure. In the aftermath of the earthquake, Sarah reflected on the site of her house, remarking, it looks as though it had been built by a crazy person. If you take the tours today, they will tell you the stories about how Sarah was instructed by a psychic medium to build the house to confuse the spirits that haunted her. Though there is no proof the psychic ever existed or that Sarah ever held a seance, it wouldn't have been odd even if she did, because these kinds of things were very common in the Victorian era. As for whether the mansion is haunted, that's up for debate. It depends on what you believe. But I'm not interested in the ghost stories. At least, not nearly as much as the reality behind the construction of the grand house and the fascinating story of the kind and gracious reclusive widow, Sarah Winchester. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like and let me know what you think about it in the comment section below. Thanks for watching.